Kulinski back in the pocket has the chance to drop the goal. Back it comes to Strensky. Up goes the kick. Up goes the wall. Strensky has kept his head. And with two minutes gone in the second period of extra time, South Africa's dream is alive once more. And it's absolutely unbelievable. The crowd has gone mad. Joel Stransky, beautiful scrum ball. No doubt what he was going to do. And he struck it straight between the uprights. Terrific kick from the Western Province outside half. We've seen that look before. It was stuff they make movies from, literally not just for the sporting achievement, the way in which it united the country under a new president. The underdogs had won their home tournament. At the first time they had been able to compete, the Springboks having been banned the previous two World Cups during the country's apartheid regime. The victory occurred as a result of an extra time dropped goal, an arm wrestle of a game. They were now world champions. And the losers, after the game, the management of the team placed the blame at the feet of a single person, a mysterious lady called Susie, a waitress at the team's hotel. The New Zealand public were told that's why we lost, I laid the blame off the sporting field. Perhaps there was some truth to their claims, or was it simply just sour grapes? I know which one I believe. 1995 was a momentous year for the sport of rugby. The end of the tournament would signal the advent of full-blooded professionalism of sorts. The sport had for a long time been paying players under the table. Shamateurism was the name given. Rugby professionalism for most countries would follow the established football framework, transit easily between amateur to professional. This would still mean in England, for example, clubs played the players' wages and they were released to play for their country. The money in the sport flowed chiefly from the clubs upwards. On the other hand, in New Zealand, every player who wanted to play for the All Blacks needed to play in the country and would be paid by the rugby union. The money flowed into and out of the central body. The best analogy I can give for those who are not familiar with the sport of rugby, United Kingdom rugby is open slather capitalism, an open model, minus the obscene transfer fees you see in football. New Zealand rugby is the equivalent of the economy of Hungary in 1965. Everyone works for the government, even today. It's a centralised model. The New Zealand Rugby Union rules the roost. To take this overview another step, Wales has four professional rugby teams, the success or failure of which doesn't affect the Welsh Rugby Union financially. On the other hand, the centralised model means the success or failure of the All Blacks does. Majorly, they bring in the DOS. Back to the 1995 World Cup and the All Blacks loss. In 1995, the New Zealand Rugby Union had a total income from all streams, that's sponsorship, television, gate takings, etc., of a pitiful 12 million NZ dollars, an amateur game to foster and to be fed from the same trough. The Rugby Union was ill-prepared to make the transition. Most of its administrators were ex-players, more suited to a rugby club committee than commercial realities of running a sport in transition. And they looked down upon, say, Rugby League, being the only other professional rugby code in the region capable of providing management expertise to manage their new sport, or to other pro codes for that matter. This would come back and bite them big time. With so much hanging on the success of the All Blacks on the paddock in the new era, one would have thought what is alleged to have happened shouldn't have. That's to say, a diarrhoea and vomiting sweeping the team just two days before the final caused by food poisoning in the Johannesburg Crown Hotel. The sources of the actual poisoning are variously listed as coffee, coffee water, water, milk, milk seafood, peri peri sauce, sauce, chicken in the buffet, buffet something, something in the buffet. buffet. In some renditions it was breakfast and the others lunch. Some in South Africa even suggest the team got it on the night before when they ate in an unapproved establishment outside the hotel. Let's just run with the hotel two days before. 
It appeared nothing they were served up that day was safe. I mean water. They weren't drinking bottled water. That's Tourist 101. And the mysterious Susie the waitress, who has never properly been identified, or has a surname, was serving them. She was to blame. That's to say, by implication, employed to deposit questionable things in front of hungry and thirsty lads. The evidence for this being what? The former manager of the hotel said there was no one of that name even employed at the hotel. And it doesn't bode well when her name is variously spelt Susie, S-U-Z-I-E, or alternatively S-U-S-I-E, and she's never been identified. Irrespective of what you believe was the overriding cause as opposed to the source, accidental or deliberate, the All Blacks and their management were acting not much better than an end-of-season piss-up a morning after breakfast for the third-grade rugby team. With so much at stake, wouldn't you think a couple of chefs on tour would have been preferable to the Waikato and Southland Rugby Union board members? I mean, in a few months, being world champions would add millions to any potential sponsorship deal. The team, after all, weren't the cup holders leading into that tournament. That was Australia. I travel extensively and I know never to eat seafood because it's risky. I'm presuming the All Blacks weren't given the same advice. The point being, leaving yourself open to mass food poisoning, letting the opposition feed you, should never have been an option. Particularly this late in the tournament, I would have gone wheat bix breakfast, lunch and tea. The food preparation should have been done in-house or supervised. And this was a country where clearly food preparation was an open issue, even in Swiss hotels. The South African themselves even got some sort of illness the week before their opening game against Australia. Said nothing and went on to win. Next we need to look at the persistent allegations the poisoning was deliberate. When we know already the host nation suffered the same fate. When you go down this path, and Pot, who had most to gain by the All Blacks being under the weather come Saturday, you only really get two options. A. A South African who wanted to give his or her team the best chance, and had the means to do so, undetected. B. Or a betting syndicate with a book heavily weighted for the All Blacks to win. For the management of the losing team, looking for an excuse for the upset win and throwing either in the air would give the public in New Zealand plenty to deflect their attention away from the loss on the paddock. Drive the very idea it could have gone either way or that South Africa played out of their skins from their collective Swedes. The evidence for A or B are the same. Zero. In defence of the players, they were disappointed and mostly took it on the chin. On the other hand, the coach of the team, Laurie Maines, took this deliberate poisoning theory to the nth degree, hiring a South African private eye to uncover who was behind it. Just the poisoning of the All Blacks, it is, not the earlier poisoning of the South Africans. That a South African PI and former Mandela bodyguard was about to engage in a speaking career and sensationally suggested a taste route that when ground down could produce such symptoms as well as a European betting syndicate whilst failing to track down any Susie whatsoever. He could have put Lee Harvey Oswald at the scene based on the evidence he presented. There was after all plenty of solid evidence at the time, more correctly liquid, of what was to blame in the form of projectile vomiting and shitting through the eye of a needle. Courtesy of a stool sample. Tests. If only so, the unaffected players could avoid consuming the contaminant as well. Better still, if there even was a 1 in 100 chance it was deliberate, and this prospect was floating around in your brain, why not make the World Rugby Club officials in town at the same time aware of the issue? get them to do the independent testing, discreetly defer the issue to them. In a stunning oversight, any evidence as to hot sauces, coffee, toxic roots, etc, etc, were flushed down the toilet. Instead, the management team, one of whom played his first first-class game in 1955, went back to the proven age-old system in football circles. What happens on tour stays on tour kept it all in-house, 
that was until the last whistle went the score read 12 us 15 them after the defeat the kiwi public were given the ball with we were robbed written all over it some even run with it today aided and abetted by a media who saw the papers and books that could be sold with sensationalist stories about the mythical Susie. Not one journalist I could uncover seems brave enough to ask the prudent questions like what preventative measures were taken? When did you take the issue to the international rugby board officials who were in town? After all, these were serious allegations the coach and management had aired that ripped at the very integrity of the entire sport. I could understand them not wanting to let the opposition get wind, but keeping it from the International Rugby Board, it seems perplexing. To close this one out, let's now back the truck up a wee bit here and give the game a different ending. Andrew Mertens, see the way he looks at the job ahead of him and sends it through. What would have happened had Andrew Mertens and not Joel Stransky been the one that made the winning kick at Alice Park? My call is the stories of shadowy betting syndicates and Susie spelt two ways would never have seen the light of day. The poisoning would have gotten a minor part in a bigger story. I mean, I'm not guessing many South Africans care their team got food poisoning before the game at the same tournament as Francois Pina raised the world's worst trophy in global sport into the air, eh? Tell me what you think in the comments. My call is sore losers. And just to reiterate, that term, by the way, doesn't apply to the players. And if you want a good Kiwi sporting yarn, then try the forgotten boxing legend Tom Heaney. Link below or press that funny boxy thing on your screen. Thanks for spending 12 minutes of your lifespan here today. All the best and bye for now.